Well, it's good to see you this weekend, Grace. Good to see those of you at each and every location, those of you paying attention to us online as we are continuing to move through this summer series, this conversation in this book that's right in the middle of your Bible. In fact, if you were just to grab your Bible, open it without really looking, you probably land in the Psalms. And it's a book that's put together on purpose for a purpose. And, And what that purpose is, is to really help us look at our souls to look at the inner parts of who we are, how we think, how we feel, how we navigate good times and bad times, highs and lows. And so we've been spending time looking at this collection of songs and prayers and poems and saying, uh, what did God's people learn as they prayed these, as they sang these, as they interacted with these? And what do we learn by God giving us these Psalms uh, in our lives? And so we've been working through them. We started at the beginning saying that what we all really long for in our soul to some degree is to be happy, to have a, a, fruitful, a fruitful life, an abundant life. And, and that's interesting because God says for those of us who follow Jesus, that's what we get. And so we've said, how does that look? How does that manifest itself? And as we've been going through the Psalms, we said the Psalms have given us a really unique focus, a focus that we want to really make sure that we're paying attention to over the course of the summer. And I want to remind you of what that focus is. We said we want to make sure that we don't miss the emphasis on the inner life. We want to make sure that we don't miss the emphasis on the inner life. If we're honest, our our world, our culture, social media really push us to think about our outer life, to think about our image, to think about what people see externally. We've said, no, let's really think about what's going on on the inside. And what Psalms is doing is it's, it's forcing us or getting us to think about how the best way we can have the best inner life is to be moved towards the incarnate King, Jesus himself, God our Father, and ultimately towards the inspired word, the truth of the law. And happy, blessed is the person who meditates and delights in the law, and happy is the person who finds their refuge in the King. And as we've been doing this, we, we've locked onto this word that shows up in a number of the Psalms. And, and it's a word that we've been trying to adopt as a practice into our lives this summer, this idea of Selah. And we said, when we see Selah, when we read Selah, when we consider it, it should lead us to pause, to ponder, and hopefully it will take us to praise. But that we would stop, we would slow down, we would consider, we would reflect, and then we would ultimately be led to consider the person of God and praise him. So we've been going through different types of Psalms. Ultimately, we said there's really two types of psalms. There's praise psalms and lament psalms, but you can break them down a little more than that. And we said there's about eight different types that we're gonna work through over the course of this series. And so, so far, we did a praise psalm where we talked about praise the Lord. Then we did a wisdom psalm where we talked about the idea of fearing the Lord. And when we posture our lives appropriately, we experience blessings abundantly. Then last weekend, we talked about a lament psalm when we go to God in honest pain and in difficult places. And we talked about how he can take the awful in our life and give us awesome growth if we trust him. And we said we move forward by focusing upward. Well, this week we're going to grab really what is the higher category, a lament psalm, but it's a specific kind of lament psalm. It's actually what's called a remembrance psalm. And again, I trust that this weekend is going to be helpful uh, as we navigate this conversation. Regardless of what you believe about God, I think there's something for all of us to grab, but definitely for those of us that are Christians. Uh, When you hear the phrase, the house is on fire in the middle of your sleeping, that will wake you up in a hurry. And it will also disorient you really fast. I think it was roughly, I don't know, 18 to 20 years ago, uh, we were up at my parents' lake house and uh, we were all sleeping and my sister-in-law began to scream, the house is on fire, the house is on fire in the middle of the night. And so I was obviously in bed with Kel and we all began to pop up and I don't, we didn't have kids at this point. And so we're kind of like, holy cow, the house is on fire. What do we do? And, and when those type of things happen, not just because it's the middle of the night, but when that type of stress or crisis shows up, you notice your heart rate go up, you notice your breathing go up and you notice your thinking get way less clear. In fact, I can clearly remember in that moment, like walking back and forth, kind of like in a circle, but not doing anything and not being sure what I should do next. And then out of the clear blue, my sister pops up and she's got her entire suitcase already packed. And she said, I'm ready to go get in the boat. And I said, what do you mean you're ready to get in the boat, Tracy? Why are we going boating? The house is on fire. 
Now quickly we realized it wasn't our house that was on fire, but there was a house really close to us across the street. And the way this house, the houses are constructed at where this, this uh, lake is, they're not very far apart. And so it was on the other side, not on the lake side. And we walked out and we began for the next 30 minutes or so to really watch as the fire department came and decided to put the fire out and do the things they were going to do. Is, is the wind going to blow the fire across the street? Is it going to get a house across the street? Is that going to move towards our house? And it was a pretty stressful environment. And I just remember thinking in that that situation, so often what I think in any situation where it's stressful, it's difficult, where there's crisis, because in that moment, I didn't have clarity of thought and neither do you. And, and here's why. The way that life works is that crisis clouds our thinking. That when we're in a moment of intense uh, stress, when a stimulus shows up, when there's some type of crisis, and it can even be a small crisis, you, you know this, you can be hungry or tired and you still don't think as clearly. But then when you start to add real crisis to your life, real challenge to your life, let's say that you recently lost your job or that you have a sudden need to move, that you have a real financial burden and these are things that you're processing. You notice that your thoughts in general are not real clear. If you've ever run into someone, particularly a young person who's been in their first car accident and you stop and check on them. Are you okay? Do you need, do you need? And they, they can barely put sentences together. They can't function what happened and they can't even get it out. Or if you've ever talked with someone who's just really gone through the loss of someone that they love. And maybe they've just found out right away in the hospital. Maybe it's even been a few days or a few weeks and you talk to them and you can, you can tell they, they can't quite get their thoughts together. They can't quite sift through it. They, they, they don't think about the right things. And that's because that's what Christ says. In fact, we know this, that when we have um, stress in our life, it actually takes oxygen away from our brain, the part of our brain that allows us to be creative and think and answer questions and be wise. And it really just goes to our breathing and to our heart to keep us alive. This is why if you've ever been in a stressful situation and you get back to your car when you've calmed down, you suddenly think, oh, that's what I should have said back then. Because your crisis clouded your ability to think and create and form answers. And, and we know this, that, that thinking is important. Thinking and being able to decide and rationalize and make good decisions is important. It's always important. But it's especially important in difficult situations. It's especially important in crisis. It's especially important when emotions are high, when things are difficult. And one of the, the disciplines that we all need to learn to do in life, but we certainly need to learn to do it when things are hard, is this right here. We need to think about what we think about. We need to learn to think about what we think about. And this is, again, really, really challenging in crisis, but, but it's just something that's true. We've got to learn to practice the discipline of examining our thoughts, at really asking ourselves, do these thoughts line up with God? Do these thoughts line up with the Bible? Are these thoughts helpful? Are they encouraging? Are they uplifting? Are they destructive? I think one of the things that's so important in life is uh, sometimes you need to stop listening to yourself and you need to start talking to yourself. In other words, you need to ask myself, what am I really thinking about? What am I focused on? What am I dwelling on? What am I thinking about in this moment? And sometimes the only way you actually know what you're thinking about is to stop and think about what you're thinking about. To really have the discipline to go, is this situation, is this difficulty, is this trial getting the best of me? And so as we begin to think about this idea of really thinking and processing Thinking shows up in a lot of different forms, right? The way that our brains work, the way that we take in stimulus and data and process life, there's a lot of different things that go on with thinking. Sometimes when it comes to thinking, we're, we're just being functional, we're eating, we're breathing, and there's thoughts that go through on that. Sometimes when we're thinking, we're learning something new, we're reading a book, we're learning how to do a new behavior, we're learning how to do a new task. Sometimes with thinking, it's, it's like processing and problem solving. Sometimes we need to learn to, to think or we do think when we're just being quiet or we're in solitude. But one of the things that we do that our brain is working on and one of the ways that we think and we process life is this, that, that an aspect of thinking is actually remembering. That an aspect of thinking, an aspect of the way we consider what is going on in our hearts is we remember 
And we've talked many times at Grace about the value of this, and we want to continue to build on that this weekend, that, that remembering is a very powerful thing to do with your mind, to stop and think about what you think about. And one of the things that you should think about is to remember the right stuff. In fact, that's ultimately what we'll do this week with 4th of July, Lord willing, is we'll, we'll stop and we'll pause and we'll remember people who have died for our country and sacrificed and served our country to make our country a great place to live and all those things. And we'll remember, we'll, we'll stop and we'll pause and we'll reflect and we'll think about our independence and our freedom and all all those things. And we'll remember. And that's a part of what goes on in our brain. And remembering is a really, really important skill. In fact, for Christians, it's a super important skill because one of the things the Bible is going to say about you and about me is that one of the problems that we have deep down in our mind is that we are hyper forgetful. And we're hyper forgetful about things that we shouldn't be. In fact, this goes beyond even Christianity. One of the the things that's weird about the way our brain works is that we are often Teflon where we should be Velcro and we're Velcro where we should be Teflon. In fact, maybe another way to say it is that when we remember, sometimes here's a problem. We forget what we should remember and we remember what we should forget. But this happens in life all the time. We remember what we should forget and we forget what we should remember. And this is, this is incredibly dangerous. And, 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 and the brain is actually designed when we look at it and the way that it plays out that we're just better at this. This is what we naturally do. So this is why you could have someone say 10 nice things to you, but they say one hard thing to you, one difficult thing, you remember the difficult thing. This is why your parents said incredibly gracious things about you, but you remember that one time they said that one thing. It's why you remember the time you got grounded, but you have a harder time remembering the time you went on vacation. It's why in your job review, they say a bunch of great things, but you remember when your boss called you out on that thing. We forget what we should remember and we remember what we should forget. We have a terrible habit on this. And yet remembering the right things is an incredibly important skill. In fact, remembering is such an important part of thinking that when we think and we focus and we're intentional to go, I'm gonna remember that, I'm gonna lock into that. It has the ability to encourage and strengthen our bones and our soul in profound ways. I wanna encourage you to open your Bible to Psalm 77. Psalm 77. Turn on or turn to. And we're gonna talk about this idea of remembering and how we need to think about what we think about and we need to be conscious with our choices to really consider what's going on and recognize that difficulty hurts the way we think. It hinders the way we process. And so we need to have a really intentional, disciplined mind to make sure that we think properly and we remember correctly. Psalm 77 is one of the unique Psalms, again, where we get a heading. We know who wrote it. Psalm 77 is written by Asaph. He's the author. Asaph wrote a number of psalms. He's a great singer and musician during the time of David and Solomon. If you want to make a note, you can read about him in First and Second Chronicles. He shows up in a few different places. And then it tells us that it's for the director of music. Scholars debate, is that actually like for the leader of the choir? Or is it even potentially like the director of music is kind of like an homage to God Almighty? Either way, it's for the director of music. And a number of the Psalms are written that way. Most think it's for a director of a choir. And then we also know that in this particular Psalm that it's, it's for Jedithan. And he's interesting because there's actually two other Psalms that he's called out to be referenced in, Psalm 39 and Psalm 62. And we know from 1 Chronicles 16 and uh, 1 Chronicles 25 that he was a musician appointed by David to lead public worship. So that's the players that are involved. Asaph is writing this. He's written this to a worship leader. And then this is how the Psalm plays out. And again, we'll see a similar motif in the way that it starts out as we saw last weekend with honest lament and pain about what's going on in the life of the person. So Psalm 77 verse one, I cried out to God for help. This is really where we began last weekend. A person in a difficult situation, a stressful situation, Metaphorically, their house is on fire. There's something that is going on. And so their thinking is being attacked. And I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands. We, we, would, we would actually say, um, it feels like potentially that Asaph is saying, I, I was in a bad place and I, I sought God. I chased God. I went after God and I, I really wanted God to help me out. And then it continues and it says this, and I would not be comforted. Whatever was going on in the author's mind at this point, he's seeking God, but he's not being comforted. It's not helping. It's not working. He's not moving forward effectively. 
text continues, I remembered you, God. I even thought about you, God. I really did. And I groaned and I meditated and yet my spirit grew faint. God, it was hard. It was difficult. Things were in a bad place and, and I was trying to think about you. I was trying to consider you, but it just wasn't working out. And then we see our word, Selah, pause. God, I'm, I'm in bed and I'm begging you to help me. I'm trying to remember you. I'm, I'm reaching out to you, but I just, I just don't feel any comfort. I don't feel any help. And again, maybe that's you. Maybe that's how you feel. Maybe that's how you felt before. Asaph pauses and ponders and then continues to move forward in the psalm. Verse four, you kept my eyes from closing. Like it was so bad, God, you didn't even let me sleep. Like I was in such pain, such confusion that my thinking was so off. I couldn't even sleep. I was too troubled to even speak. It was so bad, I, I couldn't even get words out to talk about what was going on. And I thought about the former days. So I looked back and I, and I tried to, for a moment, think about times in my life, the years of long ago. And I remembered my songs in the night. He's like, I tried to even think about when I could sing joyfully to you and worship you and honor you. And then the psalm continues. And my heart meditated and my spirit asked, and this is, this is how bad it is for the psalmist. The psalmist is gonna ask six questions in a row. And these questions are really at the heart of them is the psalmist saying, God, are you done with me? God, are you done with the people of Israel? God, are, are you pulling away your covenant love? Uh, have you quit? Are you, are you gonna be away from us? Now, let me just jump around for a second and tell you this. The answer to all six of these questions is an emphatic no. God is still involved in these things and God is still doing these things. But, but Asaph processes these, oh, will the Lord reject forever? Is this gonna go on forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love, we talked about this word last week, his has said, his covenant love, has that gone? Has it vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in his anger withheld his compassion. And maybe you found yourself in that place where you've, you may have not said it this way, but these are the questions you ask. God, where are you? God, what are you doing? God, are you done with me? Are you done with us? Are you done with our family? Are you going to stay like this? I was um, looking into some study this week about this, and I, I was reminded there's a, a woman that, that some of you may be aware of, uh, a woman named Joni Eric Sentada, and she, she's an amazing Christian woman who had a tragic accident where she, she became paralyzed. And she's been a writer and a speaker, and, 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 and I was watching a clip from her, and she was talking about interacting with Psalm 77. And she said, I, I remember when I became paralyzed, and I was angry with God, and I was frustrated, and I thought to myself, how could God do this? And then I began to interact with Psalm 77, and I interacted with these six questions, and I felt my soul asking these of God. And then I was reminded, no, the Bible tells me when I read the whole thing, the answer to all of these is, in fact, emphatically, no, God, you are not done with me. You have not left me. You have not forsaken me. You are still gonna keep doing good. You are still with me and you are still for me. But sometimes in the moment, you don't feel that. And then as it goes on, Selah. And again, maybe you've sat in your car, you've laid in bed, you've sat with another person and you've just contemplated these things and Asaph is processing all of this and it's just like, I, I don't know what to do, God. And then the pivot, then the change, then the shift and what begins to set Asaph free, verse 10. Then I thought. See, Asaph, listen to me. Asaph realizes that even though he's trying to connect to God, he's still thinking about it the wrong way. He's still thinking about God the wrong way. He's still, in some regards, being selfish. He's still, in some regards, has his eyes on himself. And so he says, I'm gonna think about what I'm gonna think about. And so then I thought to myself, you know what? Then I thought to this, to this situation, I will appeal the years when the Most High stretched out his right hand. So here's what he says. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna switch this from my situation to I'm gonna start to think about the time that God did good, really, really good stuff. 
And I'm gonna look and I'm gonna remember how God stretched out his hand to help other people. And so then this is what he says. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Everybody across the whole church say, I will remember, go. One more time. He says, I will remember. What will I remember? I will remember the deeds of the Lord. I will stop in my situation. I'll stop with the questions. I'll stop with my heartache. I'll stop with all of it. And what I will choose to do is I will think about what I think about. And what I'm gonna think about is I will remember the deeds of the Lord. In fact, he goes on and he says it again. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. You know what I'm gonna do, God? You know what I'm gonna do on my bed? You know what I'm gonna do on this park bench? You know what I'm gonna do as I contemplate my sorrow? I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna appeal to the God who's done incredible things, the God who's done miracles in the past. And I will choose to think about what I think about and what I'll think about is I'll remember your works. I will remember you are a God who works and I will look back and I will see those works. And then he says it again. He's like, I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. You think Asaph's trying to make a point? He's saying it multiple times. What am I gonna do right now? I will remember, I will remember, I will consider, I will meditate on what? Not on my situation, but on the work that you've done in the past. This is hyper instructive for us. That we would again, take our eyes off of ourselves, put our eyes upon God. And one of the things that we should do in the middle of difficulty is think about what we think about. And in that crisis say, I will remember what God has done. So he begins to, and here's what it says. Your ways, God. Now notice he switched from I language to now he's talking about God. Your ways, God, are holy. And he's like, let me just, oh yeah, in check, put myself. What God is as great as our God? He starts to like go, maybe I should ask a different set of questions as I consider who you are and I remember your works. And then he keeps going as he moves forward. Your ways, God, are holy. Well, God is great as our God. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. So now he starts to go from this generic, I'll remember the works of God. I'll remember the miracles of God. I'll remember the deeds of God. He's gonna laser in and he's gonna go to an event where he saw God do work. But before he does, he says the word again, ready? Selah. He's pivoted to questions the heartache to this conscious decision that I will think about what I think about. And when I do, what will I do? I will remember your deeds and I'll remember how you worked in your people's lives. And now from here on, he's gonna go into a very specific place. And what he's gonna do is he's gonna remember the Exodus story. What's the Exodus story? The Exodus story is when God's people were in slavery in Egypt and they were building bricks and they were just at the uh, complete Pharaoh's uh, whim and power and they cried out to God and they cried out to God and they cried out to God and then God eventually sent a deliverer and they were set free and in that setting free they walked through the Red Sea and there's this miraculous thing that happens as it's parted in Moses and Aaron and all this stuff and so here's what he begins to recall in verse 16 the water saw you God the water saw you I love this and they writhed they were scared they had fear when you started to talk very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. He's saying there was this massive storm that took place. And as so, the waters parted. Your thunder was heard in the world when your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and the earth quaked. And he's just remembering this. He's going to this specific picture. And notice what he said. He's gone from like this generic, God, I'll remember that you did really cool stuff. To now he's lasered in on that one thing. And then verse 19, as it goes forward, and then your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, through your foot, though your footprints were not seen. He's like, you did this. And then he throws in what feels kind of like a curveball, but he reminds them of one of the works that God did was he put leaders in their life. And you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. God, I need your help. God, I'm trying to think about the right stuff. God, I'm, I'm even trying to seek you. Are you gone? Are you done with me? Are you over me? Is it? And then he pivots. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna remember what you've done. And I know that you're a God who's done all kinds of great things. You even moved in the life of your people. And I remember one particular story, God. I remember that thing that you did with your people to get them across the Red Sea. I remember that. And suddenly things begin to change in his soul. 
I know that this can feel, again, trite and cliched, but it's just not. Guys, listen to me. As it relates to your relationship with God, this is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Remembering God's work strengthens your walk. Remembering God's work strengthens your walk. You may be someone, I hope you're someone. He says, I want a Jesus-centered life. I want to have a strong walk with God. I want to honor God. I want to, re- I want to run well the race that he's given me. I want to seek him. I want to know him. I want to follow him. I want to serve him. I want to be on mission. I want to be faithful. I want to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well, I'm going to tell you one of the ways that this is true is that you remember God's work in the past. It will strengthen your present walk. We know this. We, we do this subconsciously and it's maybe a crude way to say it, but like we bet on athletes and businesses whether or not they're gonna succeed and whether they're gonna win based on what? Based on how they've performed in the past. We bet on that team or on that guy. Why? Because they've been awesome in the past. We bet on that business to make a lot of money. Why? Because it's been awesome in the past. We bet on that entrepreneur to win. Why? Because they've been awesome in the past. Why do we bet on God in the future? Because he's been awesome in the past. Because we look and we go, oh my gosh, in the middle of all of this, I'm going to remember God's work, God's deed, God's hand. And what's it going to do? It's going to strengthen me to walk in this moment. And we got to think about what we think about. And we got to stop and we go, man, crisis, life is hard. My kids are doing the thing. Work is doing the thing. The world's doing the thing. And I'm not thinking real clearly. Okay, stop. And remember the works of God. Remember the works of God like generically across human history. But then ready? Remember God's works in your specific life of what God has done in you and through you and where he has showed up. The work of God in the past personally and historically is the confidence we need to go forward. One particular scholar said one time, he said, memory provides the color for hope to paint her truest pictures. Memory provides the color for hope to paint her truest pictures. Something amazing happens when we consider how awesome God's works are. In fact, for this particular psalmist, for Asaph, what happened was his faith went from restless to reassured. When he remembered the works of God, his faith went from restless to reassured. Remembering God's work strengthens your walk. And here's the thing that I wanna talk to you about for a minute about remembering, because it's not something we do natural. The Bible's so clear on this. So as it relates to remembering, here's what I wanna remind you. Remembering is an intentional choice. It's a conscious decision. Notice again, Asaph, multiple times, I will, I will, on purpose. He decides to make this in this moment what he consciously thinks about. Again, the Bible warns us about this. Over and over in the scriptures, you'll see this. It'll say, do not forget, do not forget, do not forget, do not forget. I have uh, uh, four sets of scripture that uh, quarterly, so every year I read Uh, amidst whatever I'm reading in the scriptures, I read these four sets of scripture over and over every year, once a quarter. And one of them is Deuteronomy chapter eight. And Deuteronomy chapter eight is this great story of God reminding the nation of Israel, when you get to the promised land and you get your big screen TVs and you get your swimming pool and everything works out, do not forget me. And he tells them that because he knows that when they get to the promised land, their first tendency is gonna be to forget them. This is not a newsflash to us. It shouldn't be. Why do we take communion? Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus literally set up a memorial that we would do because he's like, you'll forget what I've done for you. You'll forget. So what I need you to do is I need you to make an intentional choice to think about what you think about. And one of the things you need to do is you need to remember what I've done. You need to remember the deeds that I have lived out in the world. And you have to consciously choose this. And so I'll just ask you this weekend, Grace. How good are you at regularly and intentionally practicing the thought pattern of remembering the works of God? What have you built in your life so that you will regularly and intentionally think about what God has done in your life and what God has done in human history? Because without thinking about what you think about, without making an intentional plan to remember, the Bible is clear and your experience tells you this you'll forget. 
And yet, remembering God's work strengthens your walk. So what I want to do for a few moments is through the lens of the Exodus story, make it as personal as I can for each of us. And what was true for the Exodus was that there were certain things going on. And I want to take those things and then I want to put them in front of you to consider and ask you this weekend to remember. To remember, to strengthen your walk. And so I want us to think about these things that happened for the, the nation of Israel and how they have happened in our lives. So number one, what I want us to think about is the day of your deliverance. The day of your deliverance. The Exodus was a day of salvation. And he says the, the waters opened and it led the people through the sea, your, your way through the mighty waters, you were there. And he set them free. They were stuck and God moved. God put things in place so that they could be set free and be delivered and, and move on and have life. And they were stuck and then they weren't stuck. And God said, you're, you're here, but I'm gonna move you and I'm gonna deliver you. I'm gonna set you free. The Bible says that when you are not a Christian, when you are born into this world, you are an enemy of God. You are not God's child. You are God's creation. You are made in his image, but you don't know him. You're at odds with, odds with God. You are dead. You are suffering in your sins. You are a transgressor and you need the Lord to wake you up and you need to have a relationship where the Bible says God didn't come to condemn, but to save, to rescue. And he says that the way you do that is by faith. And there was a moment where that happened for you and you were brought to life. There's only been one time in my life where I ever really thought I was gonna die, where I was in a situation where I thought I was gonna die. And I've shared this story over the years. Kel and I were finishing our time up in Cambodia. We were coming home. We were getting ready to go to a city called Siem Reap. We were leaving the city we had been living in and we were to take a boat ride. And the boat we were supposed to get on in the morning, it was raining really hard and we had all of our stuff with us. We had our suitcases, our computer at the time, all the stuff. And so we're like, we'll wait till the afternoon. The, the rain's supposed to go. Well, we were on like a big boat in the morning and, and we didn't think it was a really big body of water. It was a pretty small kind of river where we were getting on, but we didn't know that eventually this body of water, what it turned into was like a really big freshwater lake, like a huge freshwater lake. So later on that day, we waited and we got in a boat and, and it was like a fishing boat, like a really small fishing boat. And Cal and I and two other American girls and then two Cambodians, we got on this boat and we started off on what was supposed to be, I don't know, a four and a half, five hour journey. Eight and a half hours later or whatever it is, we're in the dark. And the storms are all over the place and we're going up in the air and we're coming down and I've been on boats my whole life and I can tell the driver doesn't know what's going on. And at one point I hear him say to the other driver, I'm lost. I found out later he had never driven this route by himself before. At one point I looked at the girls on the boat and I said, just grab your passports and the money, everything else, just let it go to the bottom of the sea. And I remember thinking that my parents will find out that I died on the Tongla Sap. And this is how they're gonna find out I died because we drowned. And we were trying to get close to the shoreline so we could see where we were going. But every time we got close to the shoreline, we kept running into fishing nets. And so we had to go out deeper, but we couldn't see. And we didn't know where we were going. And then we'd go closer, but the waters were up. And so when we were going along, all of a sudden there'd be trees. And I was at the front of the boat and trees would be coming at us. And all of a sudden I'd see a tree and I'd yell, dumb chung, which is Kamai for tree. And I'd duck. And then I just hope everybody had their head. And then I'd sit back up. And this went on and on and on. I remember thinking, I don't know if we're gonna ever find Seymour. I don't know where we're gonna go. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, up to my left, I see lights. Lights that were on the top of a mountain near Seam Reap. And those lights guided us to the path that we needed to get home. And in that particular evening, the time that I thought that I was really gonna die, and I really did, I thought I was gonna bury my bride of less than two years and we were gonna be together, dead, it was done. The thing that saved me was the light. And listen to me, there was a day where the light of God peeked into your darkness and saved you. It rescued you. And my question this weekend is, how often do you remember it? How often do you remember it? When's the last time that you stopped and you said, I was done, I was toast, we were dead, we had no chance, I was lost in my transgressions. 
I was damned to an eternity in hell. I didn't know God. I was an enemy of God. But God in his grace reached down and rescued me and saved me and adopted me and made me his kid. And now I have him. I'm in his family. I have him forever. I am a child of God. When's the last time you just remembered that God did that? Because I know this. When that was new to you, your zeal, your fire, your passion, your heart, your walk was strong. But then life showed up. And this week we need to be reminded that one of the ways we have a strong walk is we remember God's work. The scripture tells us don't lose our first love. Remember the day of our salvation. 13 years old, just a punk kid at a camp who was interested in sports and cute girls. And God reached into my life and told me what he had done for me. And it changed me. It wrecked me, even at 13. And sometimes days and weeks and months go by and I'm a Christian, I know the truth, I know the good theology, but I don't remember that God rescued me. You know what I beg you this week is if you're a follower of Jesus to be reminded of when you first became a Christian and you were first rescued by God. Your day of deliverance. When you were stuck, but then you were set free by God. And I just, I'm telling you, man, when you stop and remember that, God in his goodness is gonna strengthen your walk. Second thing that I think we need to remember as we consider the Exodus is this, the guides on your path. The guide's on your path. In the story, it reminds us that Moses and Aaron were used by God to lead the flock and that God had these people who who stood in front of the nation of Israel and led them and guided them and rebuked them and served them. You know, sometimes um, you can go to a place that in general is gonna be a really cool experience. Some of them can end up bad, but in general, they're really good. You, you, you can think about like going to like somewhere uh, that's touristy, but like has ruins or something. You go to Ephesus, you go to Israel, you go to Jerusalem. Or you can think about even going whitewater rafting or going on safari. I think recently about my family when we, we climbed the waterfalls in Jamaica, Duns Rivers Falls. And those experiences are all awesome, but I'm gonna tell you what can make them better or worse, the guides that you have on each of them. The knowledge of the guides, the experience of the guides, the communication of the guides, and their ability to help you navigate whatever it is you're trying to do, whatever it is you're trying to learn, wherever it is you're trying to go. They can make you feel safe. They can make you feel scared. They can make you feel strong. They can make you feel weak. They can give you hope. They can make you laugh. And the guides matter so much. Here's what I know has been true about my Christian experience. And if you're a Christian, you know this, that I am so grateful for some of the guides God has put in my life along the way. Men and women who God used to guide me in my journey. And one of the works was at different moments, God plopped that man or woman into my life. And they said the thing, they gave me the book, they breathed life into me, they spoke anointing over me, they prayed for me, they encouraged me, they rebuked me. And I can tell you, I would not be here doing what I do without those guides. And you have people in your life. It might be your parents. It might be your grandparents. It might be a pastor. It might be a small group leader. It might be that friend in college. It's somebody that God has repeatedly used. And then he brought another one. Then he brought another one. Then he brought another one. And one of God's work in your life is that he's just brought you guides along the way. And you need to stop and remember them. That one of the coolest acts of God's grace to you personally It was your parents. It was your roommate that you didn't even know from that city out in the middle of nowhere who ended up and they were the person that said, come to this Bible study. It was that small group person who kept begging you and begging you and you were kind of annoyed, but then you went and you were like, this has been good for my soul. Man, one of the things we need to remember is the grace of God that shows up in the guides that take us from here to there and keep moving us. In fact, I would just encourage you this week as you reflect on that and remember the work of God through those guides in your life that you just thank them. Send them a text, give them a call, drop them an email, pop in on them and just say, hey, I wanna let you know God used you to be a guide in my life to move you to be more like his son. And I am so thankful for God's work and I'm gonna remember that 
I'm gonna remember my day of deliverance, but I'm also gonna remember that God has put people in my life in a very personal way to keep me moving forward. Number three we see in the Exodus is this, the divine intercessions in your story. The divine intercessions in your story. The seas parted and the people walked through and then the seas came back down and it got the nation, uh, uh, the Egyptian army and they died and, and God's people were set free. And it was because of something supernatural that God divinely showed up and interceded on their behalf to make something happen. God did a work that it was like, I can't explain it. One of the things I love to do is like when you're talking to little kids and something kind of crazy happens is you ask like a little kid, like a five-year-old or younger kid to say, how that happened? about whatever it is. How's that airplane fly? How's that car engine start? How do fireworks work? You just listen to them. And inevitably, they might not say it with these exact words, but they'll, they'll say something like this. I don't know, it just did. I don't know, I just did. See, see, because here's, here's what we know. Here, we know that at four or five years old, they don't have the ability to comprehend what they saw go on. And if you really are honest in your story, there are things that you don't have the ability to comprehend what went on. What you know is, I don't know, it just did. I don't know, it just did. I didn't know how we were gonna pay the bills. But God provided, I don't know how, it just did. I didn't know how that prayer was gonna be answered. I don't know, but it just was. I didn't know how we were gonna get better emotionally or physically, but then I was healed. I don't know, but it just did. Come on, if you are honest and you've been walking with God, you know that there are moments in your story that there is absolutely no way you can take credit for because God showed up and he divinely interceded on your behalf and he did something. When someone asks you, you're like, I don't know, he just did. He just did. I could bore you with stories where I'm like, I don't know. I can't explain it. God just did it. And you know what happens? For like a week, a month, sometimes maybe a little longer, you like, you get fired up about that. And then you forget. Which is why remembering God's work strengthens your walk because God gave you a day of deliverance and you need to remember it. God gave you guides and you need to remember them. And then God has divinely interceded into your life and you need to recall those. And it'll give you faith in spiritual muscles. And then number four, number four, the movement of your spiritual community. One of the works that God did here was he moved a people group. He moved scholars debate on how many people there were that were a part of the nation of Israel at this point, but he moved this whole group and he allowed them to experience something together as a community, strengthen this community, and he launched their faith and he moved them forward. And one of the things that God does that is so cool is that if you're a follower of his and you listen to the word, what you'll do is you'll connect to a spiritual community and then you'll get to watch God do cool things through it. I have the privilege of, of serving as a, a board member, a trustee for a, a Christian college in Indiana. And I was there for board meetings not that long ago. And during some of the free time, I was looking at some of the pictures in this one particular building. And the pictures in this building showed the university like a long, long time ago. And then closer, 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 closer. And you could see like the evolution of the change of what had gone on with the buildings and with the campus and with the city and with the town and with the colors and the whole nine yards. And you could look back and you could see that and you could see how God had worked in the school and in the city and the community and all that stuff. One of the things that you need to do if you go to Grace Fellowship is you need to stop and remember what God has done in our church. See, I'm like super biased to this with my job. But I'm telling you, man, if you go here, and I've told you this before, and I'm gonna just say this because I pastor here. What God has done in our church is just crazy. It's insane. It's so powerful and so good. And when we remember it, see, man, I'm the worst at this because I get mad at y'all all the time and I get mad where we are and I forget where we once were and I forget what God has done and I get a real bad attitude. And sometimes I gotta get humbled and someone's gotta punch me in the gut and they gotta say, stop, we may not be where you want us to be yet, but would you look back and see where we have come from? And when I do, I rejoice in the glory of God because God has done some insane things in this church. 
I've had the privilege to be here for 19 years almost. I've watched it happen. I got here, like 60 people in this place, faithful people who hung on and dug in and said, let's follow God. And since then, thousands of people that have met Jesus, thousands of people that have been baptized, campuses, millions of dollars given away, hundreds of thousands of prayers and efforts of people serving people, people making a difference, people serving our communities all over the place. I could bore you with it. The problem is we don't stop and remember it. And you know what happens when we don't do that? We're just church. It's just church. It's just grace. <laughs> this is not just grace. This is the work of an awesome God. And we must remember it. Why? Because remembering God's work strengthens our walk. Asaph was beat down, asking questions. I don't know what to do. What did he do? He stopped and he thought about what he thought about. And what did he do? He said, I will remember. Man, what would it look like for you this week to say, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna remember when God saved me. I'm gonna remember the people God's put in my life to move me. I am going to remember the incredible, miraculous, supernatural things God has done. And I'm gonna remember that God has given me a faith community called Grace Fellowship that God has done incredible things. In. And in those things, you're gonna get muscles. You know, in all of this, I'm just reminded that there's a fundamental issue that Asaph is reminding us of, and it's this. God has and will move. That is never gonna be the issue. God has and will move. Will we notice and will we remember? Will we notice and will we remember? Will we have the discipline to look and pay attention and assess and see the faithfulness of our God. So this is what I want us to do. I want us to work at this this week, all right? Put this into action while we work through remembering because remembering God's work strengthens our walk. So here's, here's a homework assignment this week, guys, all right? Practice a very specific Selah. And here's the specific Selah that I want you to do. I want you to remember a very specific work in God's that God's done in your life. I want you to meditate and reflect on it. And some of you are like, I can do that. Here's the hard part then you gotta go tell somebody about it. I want you to remember what God did. I want you to think about it, marinate in it, reflect on it. And then I want you to go tell someone this week about it. I'll even let you post it on social media. <laughs> I won't like it, but I'll let you do it. But I want you to remember it and I want you to meditate it and then I want you to tell it. That's what I want you to do. A very specific say a lot. You pause, you ponder, and you go through this process. I think one of the problems with this, guys, is not, again, that God hasn't worked. It's that we haven't documented it. You know, in our house, in our laundry room, if you go up and you, and you pull the door back and you look behind the door of the laundry room, you'll see the little tick marks of our four kids of how tall they were and how tall they were and how tall they were. And you can see how tall they've become. And you can look and you document the growth that has physically happened with your children and you do it. You know, one of the things that I don't think we do enough is I don't think we find ways to document the work of God in our lives. I'm just gonna give you a few practically for me that help me, okay? Uh, one, I keep a prayer journal. So I write out specific prayers and then when God answers those prayers, I cross them off. And what I like to do periodically is to go back through that prayer journal and look and see the things that God has crossed off. And sometimes they're not crossed off yet, but I just keep praying for those. And I look at them and then I see it. And every once in a while I'll look and I'll go, oh my gosh, I forgot you answered that, God. And you know what it does? It gives me faith. So I just, I do a prayer journal. You know, another thing that's just stupid, but I, I keep the, the app on my phone, Time Hop. It's one of the first things I do in the morning when I get up is I get on Time Hop and I go back and I look at things I've posted on social media over the years. And what I see when I post those, I'll be like, oh, I forgot about that sermon series. I forgot about that event. I forgot about that thing. I see what God's done in my kid's life. And I look back and in those moments in my bed in the morning when I go through Time Hop, I look and I'm like, oh, God has been so faithful. I get a really unique one. One of the unique ones I get reminded of is because in the Bible, sometimes they name things, certain names, or they build memorials, or they even change people's names so that they'll be reminded what God's done. And I had this for me, and I've told you this before. My daughter's name is Kaya. Her middle name is Jordan. And people think it's because of Michael Jordan. It's not because of Michael Jordan. It's actually because of a story that I love in the Old Testament. It's where the people of God crossed the Jordan River. And when they got to the other side, he said, you're going to forget about this. So build a memorial so that you'll remember it. So here's what happens. Every time I get mad at Kaya, and I'm like, Kaya Jordan! God's like, hey, shut up. I do really cool stuff, Keith. <laughs> so you can rename your kids something Jordan. That would be cool. 
So I keep a prayer journal. I try to do time hop. I try to think about even every time I say, and then in general, guys, I just journal. Journal about things in the church, journal about things in my life, journal about things in my kids, my wife. And, and all, listen, I, I'm not perfect. I, I don't get this right all the time. But listen, what all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help me think about what I think about because I know I'm forgetful. And what I want to do is I want to remember. Why? Because remembering God's deeds and God's work, it, it strengthens your walk. And so this week, I, I just hope, Grace, that we would remember how cool God has been. We would see all the things that God has done. We would reflect on it and it would just like energize us. It would be like a supernatural Red Bull for our souls to believe that God is gonna do some really cool stuff in the future. Let's pray. God, again, I I trust that there are some people that maybe feel like Asaph at the beginning of the Psalm, like, where are you, God? What are you doing? Why have you forsaken? Have you quit on me? And what I I hope this weekend does is that they would be encouraged to, to just like stop and remember what you've done, what you've done in human history, what you've done in their life, what you've done in their church, and what you will continue to do. And the confidence that we have for that is what you've done previously. What God is like our God, Father, there is none like you. May we be reminded of that as we reflect on what you've done and may it encourage us to strengthen our walk. We pray this in the name of Jesus and together we all said, amen.